join us for worship today. Today we're continuing our journey through the book of Job. We're dealing with the character of Elihu and one of the statements that Elihu makes is that the Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So I invite you to come with me to breathe in deeply the Spirit of God, to feel the breath of God washing through your body, to feel the breath of God settling into your soul, to feel the Spirit within you, the breath that fills you up, the breath that gives you understanding, the breath that gives you life. I invite you to come into this worship service and experience the breath of God, the Spirit with us. Amen. So these three men ceased to answer Job, because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then Elihu, son of Barakal the Buzite of the family of Ram, became angry. He was angry at Job because he justified himself rather than God. He was all angry also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, though they had declared Job to be in the wrong. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were older than he. But when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouths of these three men, he became angry. Elihu, son of Barakel the Buzzite, answered, I am young in years, and you are aged. Therefore I was timid and afraid to declare my opinion to you. I said, Let days speak, and many years teach wisdom. But truly it is the spirit in a mortal that breathes of the Almighty, that makes for understanding. Why do you contend against God, saying, God will answer none of my words? For God speaks in one way and in two, though people do not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on mortals while they slumber on their beds, then he opens their ears and terrifies them with warnings, that God may turn them aside from their deeds and keep them from their pride. Of a truth, God will not do wickedly, and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Who gave him charge over the earth, and who laid on him the whole world? If God should take back his spirit to himself, and gather to himself his breath, all flesh would perish together, all mortars return to the dust. If you have understanding, hear this. Listen to what I say. Because of the multitudes of oppressions, people cry out. They call for help because of the arm of the Almighty. But no one says, where is God, my maker, who gives strength in the night, who teaches us more than the animals of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds of the air. There they cry out, but God does not answer because of the pride of evildoers. Surely God does not hear an empty cry, nor does the Almighty regard it. How much less then when you say that you do not see him? that the case is before God and you're waiting for God. And now because God's anger does not punish and God does not greatly heed transgressions, Jod opens his mouth in empty talk. He multiplies words without knowledge. Remember to extol God's work of which mortals have sung. All people have looked on it. Everyone watches it from afar. Surely God is great and we do not know God. The number of God's years is unsearchable. For God draws up the drops of water. God distills his mist in rain. 
which the skies pour down and drops upon mortals abundantly. Can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds, the thunderings of God's pavilion? See, God scatters his lightning around him and covers the roots of the sea. For by these, God governs people. God gives food in abundance. God covers his hands with the lightning and commands it to strike the mark. It's crashing tells about him. God is jealous with anger against iniquity, whether for correction or for God's land or for love. God causes it to happen. Have you ever entered a conversation late? Come in at the point at which everybody has been discussing the subject for a very long time and you come in at the end. How, do you, how does it make you feel? Or have you ever been in a discussion and you didn't say a word because you weren't sure that you had enough knowledge to talk about it and they seemed like they had it all covered and knew enough and you weren't sure that they were going to listen to your voice because your voice was different than their voice. Your voice was maybe young, maybe your voice was female, maybe you were of a different nationality, a different ethnicity, a different race, a different gender identity. And you weren't sure that they could hear what you had to say. And so you kept listening to this argument, feeling like both sides got it wrong. Both sides were totally off base. And their solution at the end of their discussion was to stop talking without any resolution. That's the point at which Elihu enters this story. Elihu has not been mentioned in the whole book of Job up until this point. So that's 32 chapters. We don't know that he exists. We don't know that he's been there on the sidelines listening to this conversation between Job and his friends. And our first introduction to him is to hear that he's angry. He's angry. He is so angry. He's angry because Job justified himself rather than believing in God, in the faith that they practiced. He was angry that Job's three friends hadn't come to an answer, hadn't convinced Job of the rightness of what they were doing. He was angry because they hadn't declared Job wrong. But he waited to talk. He waited to talk when there was no answer from these three friends. And he was very angry. And so when he begins the conversation, that anger doesn't come out right away. But you can sense it as the movement of his dialogue goes on and on, that his anger becomes more real as his speech becomes shorter and more clipped. At the beginning, what he says to them is, I've been listening to you, and I'm so young in age, and you are so aged. I think that would go over real well, right? If you began your discussion by saying, hey, you're old. You didn't get it. But I just can't let it go, he says. I've got to speak out. Even though I'm young and even though you may not want to hear what I have to say, I have to talk to you about this discussion you've been having about God, about suffering, about evil. And so I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm going to tell you what I think about God. Because when I heard you talking about God, he argues, I've heard you talking in a way that pushes God out of this conversation, saying that God isn't there talking to you, isn't present in this discussion, isn't present with you. And I want to tell you, here's what I believe about God. I believe God, that breath of God, that spirit of God, that makes for understanding, that gives us 
the faith we need that gives us our direction. That spirit, that breath was breathed into us. That spirit, that breath is part of us. And that God is always trying to communicate with us. That God is always trying to talk to us. God sends visions in the night, dreams in our sleep. God is always there to lift up and share with us what is going on. Maybe the problem, you old guys, is that you aren't open to that movement, that spirit, those dreams. Maybe you've forgotten how to dream. And then what Elihu does is he takes a phrase from each of the arguments that have been going on about why this has happened to Job. And he starts refuting him. So you can see in the process of his dialogue and his discussion that he has actually listened to this conversation, that he has been there on the sidelines, part of it, and has heard them speak. And he shares his reflections on those things that he has spoken on. He shares his feelings about what is going on. I was thinking about this, this particular conversation between Job and Elihu, and Elihu and the three friends, and Elihu and God. And I was thinking about how the sense of the old established those who are in power and in control have not been listening to us. In fact, they've been having this conversation with themselves where they haven't even taken into account what other people are feeling and thinking. And the reason this has been with me is because as those fires, fires have raged on the West Coast, all up and down it in Arizona and California and Nevada and Washington and Oregon in Utah. As those forest fires have raged out west, who are we listening to? What voices are we hearing about those fires? What discussion are we having? And Here's the thing, you guys know that I've always been interested in the environment and that environmentalism is part of what I feel is important. And so that means that on my news feeds, I get a lot of news and I'll hear a lot of discussion about the environment. And right now, that part of Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram is crying out. And many of those voices are really young, younger than I am. And I know you look at me and I look at me and I go, old. In church years? But all these voices, some of them are really young. Some of them are in their 20s, in their teens in middle school, and they are crying out that something is happening to our planet and we aren't listening. And so one of the things I thought about as I was hearing Elihu cry out is not necessarily the words that Elihu talks about, but his desire for those elders to hear him to hear what he has to say on this subject, to be listened to and believed, to have his concerns being taken seriously. And I wonder with our thoughts and feelings about the West being in a climate crisis, 
with Africa flooding, with all the flooding that has taken place in the Indian Ocean region. And people crying out about our earth. And the old guys. Because let's face it, our government is pretty old. Because when most of them are older than me in my 50s, that means they've lived way longer. Because many of these are in their 60s and 70s and now in their 80s and 90s and they are still trying to govern at us. And they look at those young people. People who have, if they're in their 20s and 30s, have careers and families and have studied this subject for a very long time. They look at them and think, oh, you don't know. You just haven't lived enough. If you've lived long enough, you'll understand. And those young people are crying out for change, for something to be different, for us to figure out a way to save the planet. And they feel like they're screaming into the air, that nobody's hearing them, that nobody's listening to them, that they can't see what's right in front of their eyes when your sky turns orange and your breath is being stolen from you because there is so much smoke. And yet they give more permits to frap more gas. They give more permits to drill more oil. And the young people are crying. They're crying out in their anger and pain and fear. How do we listen to them? Because if you hear the very last section of Elihu's speech, he's describing one of the ways that we connect in our present with God is by finding God. If you didn't find God's presence in your dreams, you can find God's presence and voice in our created world, in this amazing, beautiful planet that we live on. And as he's saying this, he's describing the voice of God thundering and drawing closer as a whirlwind, as a storm is coming closer and closer to us. He's using that understanding of God's presence in the beauty of creation. God's presence and love for creation. And he's inviting us to hear the voice of God in the thunder, to see the voice of God in that storm drawing close. And maybe when we're looking out at these disasters that come one on top of the other. The hurricanes that have flooded the Gulf this year, one on top of the other, so that we are even using the Greek alphabet to name them. There have been so many. The forest fires that are burning up and down the coast. Maybe God is crying out. As Elihu talks about God's thundering voice. Maybe God is crying out to us in these fires, in this smoke, in these floods. And maybe like those listening to Elihu talk, we aren't hearing what he's saying. We're not hearing God speak to us. And maybe this week what we should do is take time to listen to those voices. The voices who have come late to the conversation. Maybe they've come late to the conversation because they weren't born when the conversation started. Maybe they come late to the conversation because they've been pushed aside and ignored. Maybe they've come late to that conversation because nobody's been willing to hear their voice. So maybe this week, I invite you to hear the voice of someone different from you. Someone who hasn't been part of the conversation. Maybe when your grandchildren speak to you about something that you think 
isn't as important as they do. Instead of debating them, maybe we need to take a piece of Elihu's playbook and remember that for those 32 chapters where he wasn't, he was actually sitting and listening. Maybe we need to sit and listen to those voices that are coming late to the conversation. Amen. As we settle into prayer today, I invite you to take a few deep breaths. As you breathe in, invite the breath of God to be with you. Invite the Spirit to inhabit you. Breathe in the Spirit of God. But truly it is the spirit in a mortal, the breath of the Almighty that makes for understanding. The spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Let us pray. Breath of God, your spirit is within us. Your breath fills us up. Your breath helps us to understand. Your breath gives us life. Breath of God, breathe on those we love. Name a person you love and then breathe in deep and release that breath. Take a breath for each name. Breath of God, breathe rain into the fire-soaked areas of our country. Breathe rain into us to cleanse us, wash our hands and our lips and our minds clean. Breath of God breathes justice. There is a lot of pain today for people who have been left out and left behind. Breathe justice that we may be braver than we think. Breath of God, breathe comfort. Comfort those who are ill. Comfort those who are grieving. Breathe comfort for all we have lost, all that has been taken from us, all that we have had to leave behind. Breath of God, breathe understanding. There is so much right now that doesn't make sense. Help us to understand what disturbs our nation from racism to climate change, from the loss of jobs to illness. Breath of God, breathe for those who have had their breath taken away. Breathe on us, God. Hear us as we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This week we are collecting our offerings for the crop walk, which happens next week. So our mission this month is to support Church World Services and Crop, which uses that money to help feed people here in the United States and around the world. And so I invite you to give generously that we may help those who are hungry to find food. Let us pray. Compassionate God, we are confronted with so many overwhelming needs in our world. Transform these financial gifts into genuine acts of concern and ministry to others. May these gifts to crop help us to end hunger one step at a time. Amen. And if nobody told you today that I love you, remember that God loves you and always will. Remember that Jesus loves you and always will. Remember that I love you and always will. May you stop and experience the breath of God, breathing in fully of life and understanding. Amen. Thank you.